Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Hangouts and Headlines, November 22nd, 2022. Lots of doubling numbers there in that particular date. I'm very happy to be with you this morning, this Tuesday morning, for a story that was going to be a Monday morning story about Taylor Swift, Ticketmaster, Live Nation Entertainment, the problems people have with the digital purchase of goods of all kinds. We've certainly seen that in the video game space with the sale of consoles and scalpers and eBay and everything else, as well as what it means when the Department of Justice starts looking at you again, as we will see as part of the story with Ticketmaster's parent company, Live Nation Entertainment. Now, to be perfectly honest, I've talked about this in this space with you all before. I'm not really a music guy. I I like Taylor Swift. We have a couple of Taylor Swift albums in the house, uh, but I'm generally not going to concerts. I'm generally not purchasing tickets for these kinds of events. So I'm going to be leaning on you guys in the chat to talk me through some of these issues, whether or not you're a Taylor Swift fan, whether or not you tried to get tickets as part of this process, uh, because I'm going to need that help. I'm going to need that context. And that's one of the fun things we can do on a live show with a community like this one. But before we get to that, and we've got a lot of tabs open for this particular story. What are you all up to? Where are you hanging out? How much fun are you having or not? Are you ready for Thanksgiving if you're in America? Are you just laughing at us, getting ready for Thanksgiving if you're not? What are you up to? I'm very happy to be here this morning, and I'm excited to talk with you all about these various things. Greetings from Germany, says, maybe I can get this right, Selaani? Is that is that close? Is that close? It's probably not. I did my best. Good morning. Greetings from Germany. Greetings from Michigan. I'm very glad to have you here this morning. Good evening, all from Melbourne, says Sibling Creature. Good evening, Melbourne. Good evening, Australia. <laughs> Master Cyberhead, so so Mr. Hogue, may I call you that? Sure. I take really all variations of my name. What do you think of the epic allegations of Google buying developers? Project Hug? I've not yet talked about Project Hug. I think that there are questions of degree as to what Epic is describing. Uh, we've seen Activision's response, I believe, that says it's not what Epic has claimed it to be. Uh, and we know Epic gets a little creative in the way that it describes things in respect of litigation. Uh, And so I want to look at it more. Uh, I certainly think Google was entering into partnerships that benefited it. Uh, Were they the kind of partnerships that the antitrust laws, the Sherman Act, whatever act you might find yourself in and given jurisdictions uh, were designed to prevent? I'm not as sure. I remember one of the things we said in Epic versus Apple is that the Sherman Act in the United States, which prevents you from entering into any contract that has a restraint of trade component is not actually enforced as broadly as it is written. And reasonable minds can differ as to whether that's an appropriate thing for the court to do on its own. Uh, But it has for 100 years uh, because every contract is a restraint of trade of some kind. right? Every contract is you saying you're going to spend 40 hours working at my uh, offices. That means that's 40 hours you can't spend working someplace else. That's a restraint of some kind. And so The courts have to look at those situations and ask whether they are unfair, whether they hurt competition, the kinds of things that we've been talking about at length as we talk about Epic versus Apple and Microsoft Activision and everything else in this antitrust space that seemingly is growing more robust and touching more industries that we care about every single day. So I'll look at Project Hug, uh, but uh, I haven't done so yet. Maybe I'll do it in today's virtual legality. I have a couple of choices that uh, I I might hit today. Uh, Potentially... Project Hogue asks asks Kim. No, not Project Hogue. Um, the Project Hug. Google just wants to give hugs. They uh, they name these things uh, wildly, right? Project Hug. Project Hug for Epic. It was Project Liberty. We need to uh, get out of the shackles of these huge multi million dollar contracts that have made us a lot of money with Apple and Google, uh, because we've decided that we'd prefer not to pay that thirty percent, and we now have the wherewithal and money to do it through the power of Fortnite V-Bucks. Uh, so all of these companies tend to do that. Uh, I work in mergers and acquisitions, right? And one of the things that folks try to prevent is the information about who's buying whom or what at what price to get out. And in law firms, you've got a lot of prying eyes, a lot of people that could potentially see emails and things. Uh, so they tend to give them project names as well. Working in Michigan, as I do, uh, most of the targets that I wind up representing are being purchased by things like Project Blue, Project Great Lakes, Project Wolverine, they're not the highest level of cipher to figure out what it might be that we're talking about 
And then sometimes some of the project names are like the subject matter of the company, which is just hilarious. It's like that doesn't help at all. But yes, Project Hug is what they call it when Google was giving out money to various partners and potentially, according to Epic, requiring those partners to not work on an app store on their own. But we'll see. We'll see. Sharon Sayer says, Lowell, no, you didn't to Shireen. I don't know why I highlighted this one, but lol, no, you didn't, Shireen. Sharon has told you. <laughs> good morning. Katia says, good morning to Mrs. Hoaglaw, co-counsel's in the house wandering around. I, I can hear her. Uh, so good morning, co-counsel. Catherine also says good morning to co-counsel. Morning says, Carrie, evening. Hi, all. Everybody's having a good time wherever they're finding themselves in the world. It's a good Tuesday. It's a fun Tuesday. We're going to have an enjoyable episode, I think, talking about things that people are excited about. Jason says, USA versus England. I cannot wait. Sorry, but England wins. <laughs> um, I think England's the favorite. Uh, certainly, if you watched the World Cup yesterday, the United States wasted two points uh, by, uh, by allowing Wales to tie in the last eight minutes of the game, what turned out to be the last 17 minutes of the game, uh, because both sides were just really flopping on the ground, really claiming injuries, really causing trouble uh, for the refs. So I think we wound up with something like 11 minutes of stoppage time. So if none of that made any sense to you, don't worry. We're not going to talk a lot about sports ball. Uh, but I was disappointed in my U.S. men's national team yesterday. B says, I hardly ever go to live concerts, hate crowds and screaming people, love musicals, though. Everyone has their seats and you don't have anyone yelling in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> laughing emojis, high five emojis. Uh, yes. Uh-huh. I, I, I love musical theater as well. I, I'm trying to think of the last concert I'd been to and you guys would laugh. Um, I don't even know if this person tours anymore. Yeah, we'll save that for later. We'll see. We'll see if I share with you what my last musical concert was. So y'all can make fun of me. Uh, Laura says, good morning to Mrs. Hoglaw again. I keep reading these thinking it's a good morning to me and they're all the co-counsel. This is fair. Co-counsel is great. Uh, Co-counsel is also in the chat answering some of these greetings. Katie says, hey, y'all, never get to catch H&H, &H, always L&D on replay. Excited to be here with a little heart. Well, we're excited to have you here, Kate. I hope you have a fun one. This is an interesting topic, I think, and a lot of people have a lot of thoughts. I got a lot of messages that were like, oh, you're covering this. Don't forget this. Don't forget this. It's like, okay, I'm going to do my best. <laughs> uh, Sherry says, I live for live music, but only for my bands. I follow a few and have seen two bands over 70 times. That is Crazy. What are your bands, Sherry? I'm curious. Maybe only one. You can save one for, for secrets. Uh, but two bands over 70 times. Ticketmaster has thwarted event goers for years. I, I know it's not a pleasant experience. I've heard that from a lot of people. Um, it's, it's always a question as to whether or not that's um, the nature of the thing. You've got a limited resource. You've got to distribute it. That's not going to be a pleasant experience most of the time. Uh, or whether that is, in fact, Ticketmaster and Monopoly powers of their parent company. We'll, we'll talk about that. Because uh, certainly the companies say it isn't. And this is where I'm going to need some extra help and context when we look at some of the statements. Uh, because I don't have the same kind of insight necessarily as I do with something like Epic and Apple and how these things function. Or PlayStation, Microsoft, and Activision. So um, I am not what you would call a Swifty. I think that's a great name for a group of fans. Um, I, I don't... Uh, I don't have i think the last taylor swift album i have is red that's one of hers right <laughs> i'm gonna get in trouble with y'all uh if i keep saying it like that carrie says my last concert was neil diamond wasn't even that old at the time it was just fun rocking it out with all the older people that were there not embarrassed he was great at some point i think you get to an age where you shouldn't be embarrassed by this kind of stuff because what does it matter if you're enjoying yourself who cares what anybody else thinks neil diamond great choice sing songs <laughs> Sing songs with melodies. There's a lot of music I don't listen to because I don't I don't think it has a melody. I'm an old fogey. What can I say? Old man shouts a cloud. Old man drinks tea. Old man gets tea handed to him by co-counsel. Old man doesn't go to concerts. <laughs> uh, Olivia, good morning. I've been ready to sink my teeth into today's topic. Good. We're going to need people to sink their teeth in. A whole bunch of memories on Facebook recently was me complaining about tickets. Like you just had a series of your posts in various times and years uh, where you complained about getting tickets to, to concerts and venues. I love it. The days of camping on the floor are gone. See, I feel that in movies. 
Uh, used to be that movies didn't really have assigned seats, so you'd try to get there to big event films as early as possible. Lord of the Rings, prequels for Star Wars, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, I love having assigned seats. I love not having to worry about it, not having to wait, not being worried that you're going to be in a position that you don't like in the theater. But there is a little bit less drama on opening night of any of these things. And uh, I, I do miss that a little bit. Uh, Mr. Borg, I am not often going to concerts, but very recently I went and watched The Who live. That was an experience. I bet it was. I bet it was. Casey says, I have a lot of thoughts on Ticketmaster as someone who worked in the ticketing department of pro sports and other musical festivals as well. But this is too short a format to comment. Laughing emoji. Oh, you have all the context though, Casey. You can jump in on some of this stuff and, and lead us lead us to the light, lead us to the truth, uh, because I, I don't have that experience. Uh, and so we'll be looking at stories. We'll be trying to analyze them from afar. This is actually an interesting headlines kind of experience because we're going to get a little bit more uh, into like, what does this look like to the average person as we quit critically read some stuff? Uh, because certainly, certainly all of the outlets that I looked at are basically uniformly against Ticketmaster. So we have a couple of statements. I think I have an Atlantic article. I have some Vox stuff. Uh, and uh, then we have the statements from Ticketmaster, including the fact that they changed their statement, which we're going to take a look at from a fun perspective, because there's a bunch of changes, and uh, we'll talk about why, maybe, they made those changes. And then we have a statement from Live Nation. We have some Department of Justice statements. We have a New York Times article. We have all sorts of fun stuff uh, in the background here. Uh, Deanna, I'm excited to see H&H cover this story, so thank you. Ticketmaster deserves the attention. The Live Nation merger was horribly unethical and never should have been allowed to happen. A lot of people agree with you. A lot of people agree with you. I, I don't know whether something like that, this is actually a pretty old merger. It's 2009, 2010. Uh, that's a long time ago to try to unwind one of these things, but we will see. As we've talked about in other spaces on this channel, the antitrust regulators across the globe, but certainly here in the United States, have been uh, at least presenting like they're going to be more aggressive on a lot of stuff. Mary Jane says, my only concert was Backstreet Boys. I threw up from sensory overload. Concerts feel like that to me. Concerts feel very Overload-esque uh, to me. And uh, I don't think my concert goes far as back as the Backstreet Boys touring, maybe? Maybe? It's about that time. Uh, so, yeah. Laura can confirm Red is, in fact, a Taylor Swift album. Yes. I got that. I got that down. I think I got that on CD. That's a while ago. I think that's a while ago. Maybe somebody gifted it to me. I don't recall buying it. Maybe I bought it. <laughs> Akaruki, co-counsel with the tea drop. Yes, I was waiting on the tea. You could probably hear my voice a little bit uh, going like that. But, um, you know, kids are off school this week for American Thanksgiving. Uh, and so I, I don't want anybody to have to wake up with me if they don't have to. You, Luna Looney says, YouTube decided to be weird and not let me know, uh, not let me know you were live. Oh, I, th I originally thought that sentence says not let me know where you live. And I was like, I, I guess good YouTube. I don't know. I mean, I say the city every every morning. Um, yeah, no, YouTube does that. Down with the suppression. They're clearly trying to keep Swifties down. Or Hogs. Or Hogue and Swifties. Either way. Just like saying Swifties. Uh, Mantha Johnny says, my last concert was pre-pandemic for 30 seconds to Mars. A little Jordan Catalano. Their first was Smalla. And we loved it. This time was a large venue and it sucked. <laughs> Got over going to shows. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I mean, that can certainly happen. Um, I know people talk about good concerts and bad concerts. You guys can let me know what your favorite concert you've been to. Who's the best performer? Who's the best performer I wouldn't expect? Maybe not that hot on the charts with the music, but just gives a fantastic show. Crazy, crazy stuff. Kathy says, I saw many awesome bands in the 70s and early 80s, including the Eagles, Elton John, when tickets were $20 or less. Can't do it anymore. Don't have that kind of money. Feels that way across the board on a lot of this stuff, right? I talk a lot about Disney in this space and their money problems uh, and their pricing problems. Does seem to be like there was a period in time where you could get a little bit more for your dollar on these kinds of things. Laura, I got to concerts, but I'm not interested in the pit life. Like standing up close to the stage. Told you guys, I need help on this. Too many people moving around. Ha ha ha. I love my reserved seats. 
Uh, my first concert, 1994, free tickets to Neil Diamond, Seattle Coliseum. Last song, Living in Blue Jeans, played it six times. I was 16. Six times. <laughs> All right. Never got into tickets. It's a thing that's disappearing, but maybe I think people are getting more into streaming. Oh, yeah. There's kind of a nexus point between streaming and Spotify and Apple Music and live things that some people posit is why they're so popular right now, the live uh, is that it's been devalued through the streaming. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. I don't know if that's in fact the case, uh, but it's a lot of fun kind of aspects to look at for this. Becca says there was something special about camping for concert tickets, the excitement, hanging out with a bunch of other people who love the band. I'd still do it if my old body would let me. I hear you. I hear you. Like I said, movies were my thing. Definitely camped out for movies, camped out for video games, Halo 2, that kind of thing, uh, but uh, did not for music. KC or Cassie says, Pink is by far the best performer I've ever seen. Clapping emoji. The energy and showmanship and pure talent is unrivaled. Pink puts on a good show. Awesome. Yeah, just like a pill. See, I can sometimes name something that somebody has done. <laughs> I'm sure that that song is probably 25 years old. Uh, so you could always get the absolutely topical and timely music references here in virtual legality and hangouts and headlines. See, I'm so glad you guys have joined me for this because it is going to be a hoot. Julie says concerts are sensory overload and a migraine, but I got one of those emails with the code because I went to 1989 at Soldier Field. Statistical bet says I loved Ed Sheeran in concert and 21 pilots. Otherwise I just go to local music groups and it's usually nice. I do like local. Yeah, occasionally, usually like a restaurant or something. Um, yeah, Ed Sheeran, I primarily know as that guy that sits around a campfire in like season four of Game of Thrones and that everybody went nuts for seeing and I did not recognize. So there you go. Last live concert for me was Elton Johnson's Yellow Brick Road. Amazing. Ooh, in excess. Billy Joel's fantastic. Been to see him a few times. And Brian Adams, also fabulous. Been to see him a few times also. I think maybe I've seen Billy Joel. Maybe. Don't know. The last concert I went to was Game of Thrones. Does that count as a concert? Because we went to that. That was that was a birthday present to me. We saw a lot of weird instruments and loved the live score along with the music clips. If that counts as a concert, then that's my last concert. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it does. I mean, I guess. All right. So I've gone to more concerts than I think then because I've gone to Game of Thrones. I've gone to Video Games Live. Um, but I was thinking of the last concert concert I went to was actually, folks, Tori Amos in the late 1990s. Tori Amos. If you had that as a guess, you are psychic and you should take that show on the road uh, because it was me helping a friend use the tickets that they had already purchased when somebody dropped out. As a classical music fan, was very confused by my first rock concert at age 40. Main band started two hours after doors opened. New to me. <laughs> they show up when they show up. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Still have to camp out for AM football tickets. Crying emoji, even though we suck. Sports, very popular, certainly. First concert was The Cure. Last concert was the Pop 2000 Tour August. Artist I've seen the most is InSync. Elton is the best I've seen. A lot of people say Elton John puts on a good show. Definitely hearing, hearing his name a few times in this space. I remember when Pink was an R&B singer and opened for NSYNC, but Forbel, she is amazing. Pink opened for NSYNC? These are things I didn't know. I think you're still wrong, Hogue. You took me to a concert twice. After Game of Thrones? Oh, Okay. <laughs> that's right we, we did go to an american idol tour concert i forgot about that we're the cool kids folks welcome to hangouts and headlines i did i forgot about that man i mean i don't know where concert ends we took the kids to like disney on ice too is that a concert i don't think it is it's got music all right okay folks i like it tragically hip uh first concert was smashing pumpkins didn't like it because they changed the songs kind of, I don't know. I've never seen this emoji before. Kind of just judgy, not terribly happy emoji. Couldn't sing along as I didn't recognize the beat. Yeah. Anyone else thinks Taylor Swift reminds them of Tori Amos? 
Um, I, fe- I feel like Taylor Swift is a little closer to a cornflake girl. And as we know, famously, Tori Amos never was a cornflake girl. Deep cuts. <laughs> Saw Madonna. She was over three hours late, says Diana. I, God, respect my time. Respect my time. Oh, my goodness. Uh, BTS Army and Swifties join forces. I don't know. I don't know what a BTS Army is. Uh, EDB loved concerts, loves concerts, and uh, goes off in Purple Heart. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I believe it. I believe it. Uh, Mr. Ho, going off topic, considering the Game Awards, will things change around the about the acquisition? There are usually big announcements. Um, no, the Game Awards will have plenty of commercials and trailers for your viewing entertainment. I, Activision has to keep advertising like it usually does. I don't know if they have much to advertise uh, in December. Um, they're still going to be selling Modern Warfare. So there might be like a Warzone 2 commercial type thing. Ha ha ha. Hog not knowing BTS. Okay. All right. So my instinct here in my head is that it is a uh, K-pop band. Um, is that accurate? Let me know. Let me know. Uh, BTS is a cream pop group. I, I swear to God, I didn't see this. Uh I, my thought process was that the last time I had seen BTS as a reference was that BTS fans, and you can correct me if I get this wrong, they like to take uh, controversies or situations on like Twitter and the fandom likes to like get involved and say things on one side or the other. Uh, and that like, that's where I knew the name from, not from their music. Um, that for whatever reason, this particular K-pop band likes to mix it up uh, with arguments and hashtags on Twitter. Is that is that accurate? BTS is the biggest boy band in the world. Are they the biggest boys? Or they're just the most popular? I'm thinking it's the most popular. <laughs> See, I like this. This is, this is way outside my wheelhouse. So you all are the experts on this stuff. Uh, <laughs> Australia has our music awards later this week. Bring on the Arias. All right, see, now I don't know whether you're actually asking for operatic singing in an aria format or whether there's a group called the Arias. <laughs> Garth Brooks, enough said. Is it enough said? What was, he had a uh, he had a fake name that he also gave an album under, right? It was Garth Brooks's nom de plume. So you can't say Garth Brooks without mentioning the other guy. Hogue is playing with fire. I believe it. This is the, you guys are fans of things and I'm sorry I don't recognize them. I promise you it is from the sincerest place in my heart uh, that I am interested and curious about what you all love on this stuff. And I do not have the information or background on these things. So I promise I'm not making fun of you when, <laughs> when there are these issues. Kelly Glancy says, it's a scary thought. Swifties and BTS, Ticketmaster should be scared. Yep. BTS, very successful K-pop band. <laughs> I was uh, Gangnam Style. Man, who remembers that? I do. I do. Army is in the Hogue chat, my world coexisting. That Army, I, so you guys reference BTS with Army, right? So that's BTS. All right. All right. We're getting there. <clears throat> we're, we're getting there. <laughs> uh, uh, Mrs. Hogue Law is talking about my daughter's love of the Beatles, I think, based on the, the things I'm seeing in the chat here. I've seen corn 17 times since 2007. They always keep their ticket prices reasonable and seem to have less of the scalping BS than other bands. All right. I honestly had no idea corn uh, was touring. Um, Hogue asking the real questions. Here's the thing, folks. You know what? You want to learn lessons and hangouts and headlines or, 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 or get the life advice uh, from me? Uh, I don't believe in stupid questions. And I think it's a very valuable thing to admit when you don't know things. Uh, and certainly for lawyers in the legal field, uh, it's it's necessary. Uh, you know, one of the biggest ethical bounds is don't give advice on things you don't understand. Uh, and so that leads to a lot of question asking. Uh, you don't know anything about your client's industry when you first meet them. You ask those questions. Here, I'm interested in this stuff. I'm interested in this Taylor Swift story. I got a lot of stuff planned to talk about in a few minutes here. Um, but I don't know what I don't know on a lot of these things. You guys are helping me. You guys are absolutely helping me out. Uh, the Arias are the name of the recorded music awards. Fantastic. So neither Aria is the song type or a band, actually the name of the whole awards. Sorry about that. 
Chris Gaines, that was Garth Brooks' alter ego with the with like the I don't know like the little goatee. Yeah, Garth Brooks. I enjoy uh, I enjoy Thunder Rolling. You can't stream Garth Brooks. Is that why I haven't thought about him in a while? Is he not on any of the streaming services I listen to? That would make sense. Uh, yes, BTS armies harness their collective power for social justice, especially through Twitter hashtags. Yeah, okay. So that is what I had kind of obviously not filed greatly in my brain, but had filed partly in there as BTS is known for mixing it up on Twitter. Um, and so thank you for that. Uh, got lots of people talking about all of their concert experiences. This is great stuff, folks. Um, and I'm glad for it. Let's let's talk about let's talk about Taylor Swift. Talk about Taylor Swift. I, as I understand it, she is a she's a mildly popular recording artist. Um, w- wins some awards. Uh, people seem to like her work. Um, <laughs> I, I am, of course, underselling uh, Ms. Swift. Uh, she is perhaps the most popular uh, recording artist right now. Certainly, Ticketmaster would like you to believe that. Um, because they are going to blame essentially her popularity on the things that happened to their service. Uh, And uh, we're going to talk about it. Like I said, we got a couple of different angles on this. Uh, We've definitely got the law aspect because that's what I do. We got the antitrust aspect. Uh, But we also kind of have to analyze exactly what's happening here. So we've got some messaging stuff. We got some fun stuff. Here's what I will say, folks, especially if you're Taylor Swift fans, and I got a lot of messages on this, a lot of comments on this. Uh, You are probably not going to get every possible thing or angle that you want uh, out of the way we're going to talk about this, because that's not what we do in headlines anyway. We basically frame things out as specific stories and storytelling. But um, I just want you all to know that because I'll cover as much as I can. And you can let me know what you think I'm missing in the chat. And I will, I will try to discuss those points with you. Uh, But I I know that there are like 50 different things to talk about here, uh, including what I probably won't get into is like the nature of scalping and, and brokering and things like that. Uh, so bring them up in chat. Absolutely. I will try to pay even closer attention to chat than I usually do having these discussion points. But I know that folks are passionate about Taylor Swift. They're passionate about Ticketmaster and concerts. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want you to think that we can hit every possible angle of this in you know a half hour to an hour uh, in going through these headlines. So bear with me on that. Love that you're here. 500 plus of you already at eight in the morning on Eastern Standard Time. I love to see you. Let's see what The Atlantic describes as how Taylor Swift broke Ticketmaster. Live music is a mess right now. Uh, And this is going to lead in as our first link from this story into how Ticketmaster was trying to control its messaging coming off of this. So, So let's take a look. Make no mistake, Ticketmaster deserves the scorn that it is currently receiving from Taylor Swift's listenership, a population of such size and power that it probably merits a spot in the United Nations. There's a lot of small countries out there. There's no doubt that it has more population than some of them. Earlier this week, the company's Just for Fans pre-sale of tickets to Swift's 2023 concert tour was riddled with bugs and delays. More shocking, Ticketmaster then canceled the general public sale because of technical issues and, are you ready for it, a lack of inventory. Yes, amid much confusion, the pre-sale became, for now, the only sale. The fiasco appears to present a tidy parable about what happens to institutional competence when a company holds what many lawmakers allege to be mon- monopolistic power for more than a decade. So really, this paragraph has it all. Uh, but it also gives us the 30,000-foot view of what happened here. Taylor Swift announced a concert. Taylor Swift put tickets up for what they're calling pre-sale. And this is always funny to me. I don't know if you can actually take 2.5 million invitations to pre-sale and still call it as pre-sale. Uh, that's kind of a semantic fight, an argument about this. But... Uh, They had all sorts of trouble with their website. People were waiting in queues forever, got their carts deticketed and couldn't purchase the tickets that they thought they had got through at the top of the queue. And then they closed it all out and said, we're sold out. Basically, it's one of those sitcom situations or something that you might see in a comic strip where you wait forever and then it says sold out. You can't get anything. And then it never goes on to what they call general sale, where you didn't have to be a verified person. And Ticketmaster is very much about this verified fan thing that they have uh, to get into these pre-sales. And uh, it certainly didn't appear to be maximally effective for them. Then you get into the second half of this paragraph here and you have the Atlantic and you'll have Vox and you'll have the New York Times and you'll have all these other outlets say, hey, maybe this is because of antitrust, 
right? They say it's a it's a tidy parable about what happens to institutional competence when a company holds what many lawmakers allege to be monopolistic power for more than a decade. Now, I have to say, as a lawyer, as a lover of the English language, this sentence is kind of wrong. Now, it's wrong because of lawyers. So what they want to say is that this demonstrates what happens when you have a monopoly, right? The lawyers probably come into this article and say, you can't say they're a monopoly. You can't say that they're doing bad things. You have to put it in this framework about what many lawmakers allege to be monopolistic power. The problem with that framework is, and I think you know this, if you've hung out with me at all in this space or in virtual legality, there are a lot of lawmakers and at least a subset of those lawmakers are basically going to call any corporation that's doing anything uh, monopolistic power, right? That, that's just kind of how it works. Uh, and that's okay. Uh, reasonable minds can differ on these kinds of things, but it does kind of kill this sentence a little bit because there's always a company that's going to be accused of monopolistic power. And so what you really want to say is it actually holds monopolistic power, but you don't also want to say that because you don't want to potentially get into liability. Lawyers, they ruin everything. Am I right? Okay, so Ticketmaster royally screws up on actually delivering what they're supposed to deliver. People have a bad experience. The Atlantic wants to talk a little bit about the fact that Ticketmaster is a monopoly. Yet, the story is bigger than Ticketmaster and perhaps bigger than even Taylor Swift. I refuse to believe it. The 32-year-old singer-songwriter is dominating at a time when live tours are, by many estimations, costlier to embark on, more difficult to pull off, and more in demand than they've ever been. Three big trends may explain why a series of annoying glitches has taken on the air of an international incident. This sentence is super interesting, honestly, because we will see this kind of backed up uh, in another article or later in this one uh, that I have prepped from uh, an artist named Lourdes. Uh, and it is this notion that, especially after the pandemic, where you couldn't go to concerts as much, there is a huge groundswell of demand. But also after the pandemic, the supply is reduced or more costly uh, because of requirements, restrictions, whatever else that you need to do uh, to get out there, especially when so many other potential artists want to go out there and, and get those space in those venues and, and otherwise get their money uh, and, and, and perform for their fans as well. Uh, so if you've ever been in economics class, you know, you got the supply curve and you got the demand curve. Uh, and if supply starts costing a bunch, well, then supply is going to go down. And if demand starts asking for a lot, well, the, the requirements are going to go up. Uh, and so there's going to be there's going to be a, a market imbalance there for at least a time. Right. The one thing to remember about economics and for those of you that don't know, I, my degree is in economics. Uh, I, I have a, I have a post graduate degree in law, of course, my JD, but my my undergrad degree is in economics. Uh, there's going to be a transition period as you move kind of resources around. But in that transition period, when you've got a limited resource and virtually unlimited requirements for that resource, here, seats in arenas to watch Miss Swift, um, well, you've got a problem. You're either going to have to control that resource with price, so you make them all $10,000 and you lower it down to a thing that you actually can seat, or you're going to lower that requirement with time slash luck. Right. And Ticketmaster has basically done it with time slash lock. Taylor Swift doesn't want to charge $10,000 on her own for a ticket. Who can blame her? That would look bad. Uh, and so they go through this process and then Ticketmaster has all of these requests and they have this number of tickets and all hell breaks loose. And we've seen this across the digital landscape. It's not just Taylor Swift. We see it with PlayStation 5s and Xbox Series X is a little less in the latter category at this point. Uh, but we've seen it for two years now with those products, people not being able to get them because of sourcing and over demand and lack of supply. Uh, and this is that just in a kind of more ephemeral licensing concept. You're licensing that seat for however many hours the concert takes. Now, the Atlantic does give credit to Taylor Swift just being super popular, right? Taylor Swift is Taylor Swift, the Swift of it all. According to Ticketmaster, the desire for Swift's tickets smote all records and reasonable expectations. Worked in smote, Atlantic, smote. 14 million users and bots tried to buy the tickets, the company chair said, and a Ticketmaster blog post reported that the pre-sale tra traffic eclipsed any previous peak by a factor of four. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit because Ticketmaster backs off some of their claims. Ticketmaster makes different claims. Ticketmaster makes sure their branding is right when they change this particular statement. And heck, let's take a look at it right now. So here, thankfully, from our friends at The Verge, they were able to capture the original statement and then further thanks to Ticketmaster for having their new statement up on their actual blog. So we'll be able to look at both. 
The Verge says Ticketmaster yanked its explanation for the Taylor Swift ticket debacle. The company had posted about what went wrong in two separate places on its website, but now the posts are gone. This is as of November 18th. They talk a little bit about it. They talk about the new post as well, which they describe as having some minor changes, but that's not good enough for us. That's not good enough. We need to know more about what these changes are, right? That's what headlines is all about. Let's let's examine some minor changes. So first, we have the Taylor Swift on sale explain. And maybe you guys are familiar with this term. I actually hadn't seen on sale as a reference. I'm not sure what good it does to describe something as an on sale rather than just a sale. But maybe they don't want it to look like they're trying to sell Taylor Swift's. So the Taylor Swift on sale explain, and, and we get a few things here. The Eras on sale, and we'll see reference to Eras here. You can see the picture. It is the Eras tour presented by Capital One. They're probably not thrilled about how this went down for their users and things like that. I believe the Capital One pre-order got canceled, I want to say. The Eras on sale made one thing clear. Taylor Swift is an unstoppable force and continues to set records. We strive to make ticket buying as easy as possible for fans, but that Hasn't been the case for many people trying to buy tickets for the Eras Tour. We want to share some information to help explain what happened. So they want to talk to you about it because they are getting pilloried in the press. Uh, and so going so far as to potentially bring in the government on this type of stuff. Now, a couple of things happen here. We can see I've highlighted in red where there are changes. And we can see this first change. It makes perfect sense uh, to, to anybody that looks at it. You have this opening paragraph. They don't really say much to the fans. We strive to make it easy, but that hasn't been the case. We want to share some information. The very first thing they add is in the middle of that paragraph, We first, we want to apologize to Taylor and all of her fans, especially those who had a terrible experience trying to purchase tickets. Now, as a messaging concept, you can't really pull this off on the internet, right? You get some idiot with a YouTube show on mornings uh, going through this and being like, well, let's go analyze what you changed because that's an interesting conversation. Uh, and... Then you say that first you want to apologize, but it, it's apparent that that wasn't your first instinct, right? Just as an overall concept, Ticketmaster's first instinct, no matter what they say here, is not to apologize. Now, it's, it's a good thing that they added this. I will tell you as we go through the kind of differences here, one of the things that seems apparent to me is that Taylor Swift and her team got in contact with Ticketmaster and didn't like how they were being dragged into some of the faults here. Uh, and so you'll see references to what Taylor does or wants to do or what her team wants to do removed or changed or modified. Uh, that doesn't present, prevent Ticketmaster from trying to defend itself on this stuff. But yes. Okay. So you didn't even bother to apologize to my fans. Okay. So this gets added after the fact. Everything gets deleted. It's getting killed as a message. One assumes that's why it gets removed. And then we move on to some actual information. We knew a record number of fans wanted Taylor tickets. And we'll just read through this section so that people can understand what Ticketmaster is claiming originally and then what they changed when we're looking at the post today. By requiring registrations, verified fan, that's a capital V, capital F. That's a feature set or brand name or application that Ticketmaster uses. Is designed to help manage high demand shows, identifying real humans and weeding out bots. Nobody likes bots on this kind of stuff, right? Bots go get it. That gets in the hands of scalpers. Scalpers move the the tickets around and you, then you get the stories about, hey, here's a $20,000 ticket uh, and that's just mean to your actual fan base. Keeping bots out of queues and avoiding overcrowding helps to make waits shorter and on sales smoother. It's gotta be on sales is one word here. That's just a typo, I think. That's why Taylor's touring team, AEG, and the Messina touring group chose to use verified fan for her on sales. Okay, so this is what I was talking about, right? So if you're ticket master, you start having conversations with your artist who is pissed. Is, by all indications, then you've got in your explanation statement an ad, right? Uh, verified fan is great. Verified fan works awesome. That's why Taylor chose it. Oh, okay. So this is a negative press event and you've just dragged Taylor and her team in. Well, guess what gets removed in the statement? I've highlighted it here with this red blank. Keeping bots out is important. What? Do we have anything about Taylor? No, we don't have anything about Taylor. So we move on from there. Based on fan interest at registration, we knew this would be big. Over 3.5 million people pre-registered for Taylor's Verified Fan, which is the largest registration in history. The huge demand for Taylor's tour informed the artist team's decision to add additional dates, doubling the tour and number of tickets available so more fans could make it to shows. Oh, okay. Once again, you've dragged Taylor in as an ad. The huge demand for Taylor's tour, as indicated by our analytics and what's happening, 
informed the artist team's decision to add additional dates, doing all this great stuff for you, for you. No, no, stop dragging me in, says says Taylor Swift. But before we get there, oh, wait, um, we did this. We required it. We keep bots out of queues. Based on fan interest, we knew it would be big. But over 3.5 million people pre-registered on what? For the Taylor Swift Ticks pre-sale powered by Verified Fan. Okay, all right, Ticketmaster. It's probably lawyers again, or at least PR people. You get the brand name in there. You get the brand name in there good. Okay, which is the largest registration in history. And then, oh, we're removing this. No, no, we're not We're not talking about Taylor doing anything. We're not bringing her into our bad news. So this gets removed right off the top. The huge demand for Taylor's, oh, we got, we got rid of that one. Historically, around 40% of invited fans actually show up and buy tickets, and most purchase an average of three tickets. So working with the artist team, around 1.5 million people were invited to participate in the on sale. Again, it's one word. I don't even, what, what is this thing? For all 52 show dates, including the 47 sold by Ticketmaster. Now, that's an interesting story in and of itself. There's five show dates that Ticketmaster isn't involved with. But if we go and we look, we've still got that historically around 40% of invited fans. And I actually, this highlight didn't take, actually show up and buy tickets and most purchase an average of three tickets. And then you see here, working with the artist team, around 1.5 million were invited. Oh no, you get, your, you get our name out of your mouth, Ticketmaster. Stop that. We are not in this together. Um, so now here's a couple of interesting things just from the statement, right? We, we're, we're analyzing Taylor Swift's team clearly going to Ticketmaster and saying, stop that. Stop it. Stop it. Uh, but also we could just listen to what they're talking about. So they overbook things, right? We all know this from airlines and airplanes, right? You go and you look at your analytics. You go look at your historical precedents. You say, hey, we invite this amount of people. These amount of people are going to show up. This amount of people are going to buy this many tickets. We can do, we can aim these things uh, at this. And uh, and so here that failed. Why? Because almost certainly Taylor Swift is an outlier for historical trends, especially historical trends coming after a pandemic. Like wh where is your historically coming from? Right? People are super interested in going to concerts right now. I'm not one of them, but I can tell you that it's the truth. I hear about it from all sorts of friends and colleagues. So that's great. But it does mean that you can't use trends that are from a historically inaccurate time period, right? Right? So it might not just be Taylor Swift. It might be Rihanna next. It might be, I don't know, does BTS tour around America? I have no idea. It might be BTS. It might be anybody. Um, but you can't necessarily use this. And then when they say, when they say, you know, we worked with the team to come up with who was sent codes, that's putting blame on them when very much, if I'm Taylor Swift's team, I say, look, Folks, we pay you money. We work with you. You get cuts of all this because you're the experts. <laughs> so stop. Stop working with the artist team and what Taylor did or didn't do. Stop it. The remaining 2 million verified fans were put on a waiting list. Now, that sounds like, well, you know, they're put on a waiting list. They probably come up. We're not worried about it. Twiggy Master says, you know what? We actually should talk about this a little bit more. They're put on a waiting list on the small chance that tickets might still be available after those who received codes had shopped. I have no idea what communications Ticketmaster had with these folks uh, after they're put on a waiting list because these are verified fans. Apparently that makes it 3.5 million people sign up for the verified fans. You have that also matched up here. Only 1.5 million people are given codes and then 2 million have to wait for codes. And then, well, all hell still breaks loose. Now, They've got this picture here between these sections, all right? A couple things happen here. They've got this picture to try to show this is their traffic. Got real bad, real quick on them. Um, and we can look at this picture, I think, a little bit better here, but you might notice some differences already. So this is 15 November. This is when they try to sell tickets to the Eras Tour. This goes back till about the top of the year, it looks like. So this is this is 2022. So they don't have any reason to believe there's any problem necessarily. But I don't know how many kind of super groups or super artists uh, are, are trying to sell tickets or start new tours through this era. I just don't know. Um, and then they say it comes up here. Now, you might notice this is kind of weirdly balanced as a card, right? It's like, okay, well, this, this is a lot of negative space. What, what is this space doing? Well, if you were really paying attention, this is like a Highlights Magazine type episode of Hangouts with Headlines, you would have seen they used to have a title. Taylor Swift demand was twice the top five tours in 2022 and the Super Bowl combined. That is no longer part of the card. Now, that's interesting. 
And I honestly can't figure out why this might be. I don't know if chat has a reason uh, that this might be. Uh, it's possible Ticketmaster got that stat wrong vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Super Bowl or, or anything else, but it would seem to be included in this kind of time frame that they've got here. Uh, or it might be that Taylor Swift doesn't want to be out there promoting Ticketmaster with the notion that I'm twice as good as everybody else that bothers to do art um, or sports in this particular case. Your mileage may vary as to how that happens, but we do have reasonable indications that Taylor Swift's team is, is looking at these uh, particular blog posts and responding to them uh, when they think they reflect poorly on them. So we could take a look at that. Obviously, they removed that heading. It makes it look all weird. Also note that this used to be between these two sections. It no longer is. So it's been dropped down a little bit lower uh, in where you'll be reading. And then we got some more changes. So let's take a look at how they look at this first. The demand for Taylor broke records in parts of our website. So somebody says, wait, the, the demand for Taylor, we don't, we don't like describing it that way. It's too, it's too personal. The demand for tickets to Taylor's tour broke records in parts of our website. Now that's a, that's an objectively worse heading. Uh, that, that isn't, it, it isn't super useful, but again, don't know why these changes are being made, but it is funny. Historically, working with verified fan invite codes has worked as we've been able to manage the volume coming into the site to shop for tickets. However, this time, the staggering number of bot attacks, as well as fans who didn't have invite codes, drove unprecedented traffic on our site, resulting in 3.5 billion total system requests, four times our previous speak. And Tim Riggs makes an excellent point here about that chart. Let me see if I can pull it up. Uh, that they are already playing with axes. Right. This is one thing to always note is that if you don't get all the information on an X, Y chart like this one, then there's a reason that they're not giving you all that information. Uh, and so you can keep that in mind as well, uh, that uh, you don't tell me what the Y axis is and I'm going to take it with a grain of salt, just like an anonymous source, as we do in Hangouts and Virtual Legality. So take that with a grain of salt. Excellent comment, Tim. Thank you. Glad I caught it. Um, so historically, it's worked. But this time we had three point five billion people. Never before has a verified fan on sale sparked so much attention or uninvited volume. Uninvited. You're running a website, dude. <laughs> I know I know they're unexpected. I think unexpected is probably better. Uninvited. You get out. <laughs> this disrupted the predictability and reliability that is the hallmark of our verified fan system. Always perfect. It usually takes us about an hour to sell through a stadium show, but we slowed down some sales. So this is actually active voice. We did that and pushed back others to stabilize the systems. The trade-off was longer wait times and queues for some fans. Overall, we estimate about 15% of interactions across the site experience issues, and that's 15% too many, including passcode validation errors that caused fans to lose tickets by that they had carded. I love this, right? This, this, this language, you see this in a bunch of corporate messaging. We estimate about 15% of interactions across the site experience issues. Now, that's designed to sound small. Only a few people were affected by this. It's been outsized in the coverage. Uh, but then you have to go back and say, but we understand that that's still 15% too many, right? And yeah, it's it's pure corporate messaging here, folks. Uh, but that's not all, right? Because they don't like exactly what they wrote here. So they changed a few things. So we already talked about the heading. Historically, we've been able to manage huge volume coming into the site to shop for tickets. So those with verified fan codes have a smooth shopping process. That just gets added. <laughs> I don't know why. This is PR from Ticketmaster, just so you know. Verified fan works like almost all the time. 70% of the time, it's good every time. However, this time the staggering number of bot attacks, as well as fans who didn't have just codes, just says codes, as well as fans who didn't have invite codes, just drop the word invite again, right? Drove unprecedented traffic on our site, resulting in those requests that we talked about over our previous peak. And then when we get to the never before, never before is changed. We handle on sales for countless top tours, some of the biggest sporting events, and more. Why? Why are you pitching yourself, Ticketmaster? Never before has a verified fan on sale sparked so much attention or traffic. This disrupted the predictability and reliability that is the hallmark of our verified fan platform. Here's a look at how that traffic compared to every other day. So that's where they move the picture. You also see that they drop the uninvited volume. Uninvited is bad. So many PRs is like, what? Uninvited? These are customers. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, here's that picture now without headling. 
Um, and then the trade-off was longer wait times in queue for some fans rather than just longer wait times for some fans. Okay, that's a minor change. have no idea why you made that. Despite the disruption, Swifties powered through and helped Taylor set a new record. You get your name out of my, you get my name out of your mouth. Stop it. What is this? You're calling my people Swifties. We are not in this together, bro. Despite the disruptions, a new sales record was set. See, they're trying. They're trying. This is supposed to be endearing Swifties from Ticketmaster. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Tim Riggs with a super chat comment. While peak traffic issues like this can be difficult to plan and prepare for, I, I am totally sympathetic to, oh my God, no retailer has really done it well. Immediate thought is that they should have staggered the times available by venue. Only have one concert venue in at a time. Yeah, perhaps that could have worked. If it really did overwhelm their systems, I'm at least sympathetic to that a little bit. Again, in the world of video games, you see that a lot for games that launch, right? Um, popular games that launch have only so much server infrastructure. And you really don't necessarily, if you're the game developer or publisher, want to have the, the server infrastructure in place and costing what it would cost. Uh, for that kind of huge influx at the top, uh, you kind of, at least this has been my historical experience, uh, you kind of let there be a few more errors on launch day and a couple, maybe a few days after because you know that your actual baseline of, of interactions, engagements on your server is going to be less than that everybody bought it today kind of concept. Um, so that makes sense to me. And Tim, that's a good idea. Maybe Ticketmaster should hire you uh, because I think that actually would work. Um, that would work well. Uh, I think you get you get your little invite, you know, 15 minutes separated between venues if your system can run them through Ticketmaster uh, and then uh, and then get people on to the next thing. So, yeah. Now, despite the disruptions, the Swifties powered through <laughs> oh. over two million tickets were sold for Taylor's shows on November 15th. The most tickets ever sold for an artist in a single day. Every ticket was sold to a buyer with a verified fan code. Nobody, not even a bot, could join a queue without being verified. So, again, that three point five billion is not is Ticketmaster is not admitting or accusing them of actually selling to bots. They're saying that their verified fan process prevented bots from buying things. The 2 million tickets we sold only went to verified fans. 90% fewer tickets are currently posted for resale on secondary markets than a typical on sale, which is exactly why the artist team wanted to use verified fan to sell their tickets. And <laughs> what do you get? You want, you guys got bets about whether this is going to stay any bets. You're talking about the artist team. Ticketmaster is not currently reselling any Taylor tickets beyond Taylor's on sale. We also sold another million tickets for other events across our site on Tuesday. There were other people than Taylor Swift on November 15th. Perhaps, perhaps. Now, let's see what they did in their message. First of all, we got to get the brand right. Over 2 million tickets were sold on Ticketmaster for Taylor Swift, the era's tour on November 15th. The most tickets ever sold for an artist in a single day, right? It's not just sold sold for Taylor's shows. Again, this is too personal probably. So we, re we replace it with branding and then got a whole new section. All 2 million tickets for the verified fan on sale were sold to verified fans. Only ticket buyers who were verified were permitted to enter a queue. Verification is tied to a user's account and validated at login, which is why users only had to log in to enter the queue. For additional security, ticket buyers also had to enter the unique code to complete their purchase. No one who wasn't verified was allowed to enter the queue, but the huge traffic hitting the site overall meant we had to slow down queues to keep them stable. Now, I can't tell you exactly what this says because this is gobbledygook, but it sounds sounds like we took 3.5 million registrations for verified fan. We gave codes to only 1.5 million of them, but all 3.5 million could log in. And if they get to the end without a code, they can't purchase the tickets, which sounds God awful. If you were in this queue, if you dealt with this, folks, is that what happened? Did they only give unique codes to some, but you were still able to log in and go and try to get them if you didn't have that code? Let's see what dad has to say. Good morning, Papa Hogue. What a bunch of nonsense. Okay. Some, so some clicks on a website are uninvited. Yep, it's bad language. That'll be news to everyone trying to attract clicks today. <laughs> Always blame someone else. Ticketmaster obfuscates a total failure. This is life growing up at Hogue House, guys. Dad expects results. <laughs> I don't think you're wrong, Dad. I don't think you're wrong. Uh, and certainly uninvited. Some PR guys like, what? How would how would you ever use that word in a blog post or statement from us? Uh, thanks for the chat, Dad. Uh, I, I, I don't think you're wrong. 
I don't think you're wrong. Okay, so they add in this whole section of trying to explain what verified fans is. Like they clearly look at this and say, this isn't enough. Every ticket was sold to a fan with a code. Um, we have to talk about why there were so many negative experiences. And it's because it sounds like we set the onboarding to be crazy. There are more people that are verified without codes than people that are verified with codes. So if you're letting them into the login process, you're going to have this result. This is the kind of thing that should be whiteboarded. How, how do you not see this? Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, let's see what this Sarah has to say here. She's got a little bit more information. It sounded like you needed the code, but how hard was the code to get? I'm not a Swift fan, but somehow was sent to code. So I imagine I'm not the only one. So this Sarah, you were a verified fan on this. Um, and, and you had registered in case you wanted to go and they got you a code. Is that, is that what happened? Uh, talking about dodgy graphs. Did you see the recent one from ABC news? I have not. I love that profile picture, by the way. Um, but, uh, yes. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious. Okay. And then they want to get more into the weeds, right? We're getting accused of a lot of crap out there, which is that you're seeing these $20,000 tickets on wherever you're seeing them uh, from secondary sources. Uh, and it's not it's not our fault. We did a good job. We did a good thing. Less than 5% of the tickets for the tour have been sold or posted for resale. On sales that don't use verified fan typically see 20 or 30% of inventory end up on secondary markets. Ticketmaster, Ticketmaster, let me talk to you. This is you and me. Nobody's listening in on this, Ticketmaster. When you are making an apology message, which this should be, remember first, we're apologizing to the fans. This is a big negative thing. People look at you badly. You might have the Department of Justice swinging at, you know. When you're apologizing, I know this is hard. Try not to turn your apology into an advertisement for your goods or services because that comes across as massively disingenuous. You don't need this sentence. You don't need this comparative. I might be interested to know it, but this sounds like you're selling me something. Uh, and no, I'm not an artist management team. So you're technically selling things to artist management teams, but don't advocate for the glory of your process. <laughs> this is a bad day for you. You, you. you own it. You apologize. You try to make it a one day story and not a one week story and you move on. When you start advertising your stuff, this makes people upset. Okay. That's just between you and me, Ticketmaster. Nobody's watching. Nobody's watching. Uh, Ticketmaster then continues with kind of a summary. We're great still. The biggest venues and artists turn to us because we have the leading ticket technology in the world. Doesn't mean it's perfect. And clearly for Taylor's on sale, it wasn't. I hate this term. But we are always working to improve the ticket buying experience, especially for high demand on sales, which continue to test new limits. Even when a high demand on sale goes flawlessly from a tech perspective, many fans are left empty handed. For example, based on the volume of traffic to our site, Taylor would need to perform over 900 stadium shows, almost 20 times the number of shows she's doing. That's a stadium show every single night for the next 2.5 years. While it's impossible for everyone to get tickets to these shows, we know we can do more to improve the experience, and that's what we're focused on. Always being better, Ticketmaster. Uh, and so they're, they're trying to get out in front of this. Again, they kind of drag Taylor into this. Now, they have a good point here. This is the problem with crappy corporate messaging. We started with this point. When you have a mislink in supply and demand, you're going to have to cover that by either increasing the price of things to lower the demand or by having some kind of time-based luck thing uh, that Ticketmaster is actually in the business of. So they have to go and say, look, folks, there's 3 million of you, 3 plus million of you that want these tickets. That's Taylor can't, Taylor can't play that much. Uh, but... That's not really what we want to do. So you stop talking about Taylor like she's a person. We are not friends, Ticketmaster. And clearly for Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour on sale, it wasn't. We're working to shore up our technology for the new bar that has been set by demand for the Taylor Swift, the Eras Tour. Once we get through that, if there are any next steps, updates will be shared accordingly. Okay, so this wasn't playing well with people. It was like, oh, we're not trying to say, we're not trying to say it's perfect, um, but there's a lot of demand. And, and Taylor would have to, to do a lot of shows. And we're, we're still working on it. And we're not going to talk about Taylor like she's our friend. We're, we're not going to use just her name, Taylor's on sale, Taylor Wood, uh, these kind of things. We, we don't, we don't want to talk about that. We got one Taylor Wood here, but that's it. While it's impossible for everyone to get tickets to these shows, we know we can do more to improve the experience. And that's what we're focused on. Okay. All right. Same last sentence. But that's what Ticketmaster went out there with. And it ain't great, Bob. It ain't great.
in either form, but it certainly ain't great when they initially put it up. And the internet is forever. The other, the other lesson to be learned here, right, is like, okay, you want to respond fast to these things if, you, if you're if you in this kind of situation. I get that. But you can't respond this fast. Got, got to vet this stuff a little bit. You can't then pull it down and replace it all with this, especially if you're in the business of working with artists, right? You can't go and pretend like you're besties with Taylor Swift, right? You just screwed her over. She looks bad in the public marketplace because she worked with you. Now, Taylor Swift is a master at public relations and social media. And I, I don't actually think this winds up hitting her uh, where she lives, but it certainly could have killed some other artists uh, that had this happen to them. And in this particular circumstance, you can't just go and say, first, we're not going to offer an apology. And then let's talk about Taylor. No, no, you got to start. You got to start treating this like a business. Uh, I do have a super chat here from Tim. If you mess up, don't talk about how awesome you are in the apology. If you apologize, don't stroke your ego while appearing to blame your client. 100%. That's what happened here. And while it got corrected a little bit in the in the version that's currently up on their site, it's not corrected all the way. And they're still trying to sell their, uh, we're awesome. We're awesome. Sometimes you just have to fall on the sword. You can't also try to advertise your services while the sword uh, kills you. You can't, you can't do that. So that's what Ticketmaster is all about. And this is, as you can probably guess, rubbing people the wrong way. Uh, and so that's part of this story as well. So Ticketmaster says all this. The Atlantic gives this credence, and it deserves some credence. Taylor Swift is super, super popular. At these levels of numbers, there aren't enough tickets in the world to get everybody that wants tickets into those venues. Uh, Atlantic says, Swift somehow retains the fascination of the most important constituency for pop music, teenagers. But she's also a cross-generational object of acclaim, working in her prime, consistently winning Album of the Year Grammys and smashing sales records. Yeah, I believe she won a bunch of awards this weekend. I don't, again, I don't even know what awards it was. I think Wayne Brady was involved. So Taylor Swift is Taylor Swift. She is unique. She is she is a, a, a unique snowflake in this particular circumstance, meant with no derision at all. Uh, I, I don't like that that was taken away and made derisive because I like snowflakes. In a digital era, live music is more important than ever. The Atlantic posits that when streaming makes music more plentiful and disembodied, the rarity and tangibility of live experiences takes on new value. I tend to look at this a different way, that there's more exposure to music more often, and that creates bigger audiences for these things. I don't really think it's like Spotify exists, and that makes live services better because Spotify devalues music availability. That doesn't really work for me. Reasonable minds can differ on this stuff. Your mileage may vary. Uh, but I think it's that the kind of democratization of music availability means that you're reaching the very tiny nooks and crannies of where your audience could have been. And in an internet focused world, that means that your audience is much bigger than it might otherwise have been across the board, uh, but certainly probably exponentially greater at those really superstar levels. Uh, that's, that's just my opinion. The Atlantic disagrees. The pandemic has messed up the live music ecosystem. The pandemic has pushed that demand even higher, but the costs and stresses of touring have also by all accounts skyrocketed lately. In the past few months, big name talents, including celebrities like Justin Bieber and Sean Mendes, as well as any type such as Animal Collective and Santa Gold. This is like, this is like, is this what it sounds like when I talk about Final Fantasy to y'all? Is that, I don't, I don't know who these people are. Have canceled and rescheduled tours. The cited reasons as varied as money and mental health point to an undeniable reality. Something is off about the live music ecosystem. In a recent letter to fans, the pop star Lord explained the situation. Let's start with three years worth of shows happening in one. Add global economic downturn, it's real folks, and then add the totally understandable wariness for concert goers around health risks. On the logistical side, there's things like immense crew shortages, extremely overbooked trucks and tour buses and venues, inflated flight and accommodation costs, ongoing general COVID costs, and truly mind-bogglingly freight costs. Ticket prices would have to increase to start accommodating even a little bit of this, but absolutely no one wants to charge their harried and extremely compassionate and flexible audience any more effing money, says Lords. Now, this is the reality of the situation, right? And I've certainly come down in this space for people that have raised those prices. You look no further than Sony and their PlayStation 5 that raised their prices of their units everywhere but the United States a substantial amount. And this is real. You've got fights for freight. You've got fights for goods and services. You've got fights for space. You've got fights for crew uh, and all this stuff. And all the while, you've got higher demand than ever. So the realistic way to handle this, as Lord says, if you're reading this in an economics textbook, <clears throat> is you, you raise the price. You move that demand down to meet whatever supply you can provide and you hit that price. But as we've also talked about in virtual legality and hangouts and headlines, 
that can be bad. And when do, what do I mean by that? We've talked about Disney parks. Disney parks continue to be filled, full. They continue to sell out and they continue to raise the price. Uh, and one of the things I've said is that you're killing your fan base. You're killing what is to be your long-term growth curve because at the point in time where you're having people only go once, save up all their money for life, and then potentially deliver an experience that isn't valued at that level, which almost no experience can be, uh, and you're killing that kind of bond that should be passing from you know parent to child in respect to Disney, maybe in respect to Lords. I don't know. I don't know what she thinks. Uh, she sings royals. We can never be royals. Yeah? I'm hip, right? I'm, I'm sure I'm hip. I think that she does. She sings that royals song. <laughs> um, and you get into this situation where you don't want to be uh, the elitist snooty person that's only selling your tickets for whatever that might be to clear clear demand, uh, $2,000, something like that. Uh, and so in this particular situation, I understand all of this, but it does make it so that you have to go through these lines and services. And right now, Ticketmaster does appear to have control over that. Never, Swift, Swift, nevertheless, appears to be affected by a widespread trend across live music. Supply and demand aren't matching up and core systems are breaking down. Now, I don't know why the Atlantic doesn't go to the next step because Lord identifies it correctly <clears throat> that, you know, consumers are going to have to accept higher prices or they're going to have to accept this kind of weird logistical line situation. I mean, like th those are really the options here. Meanwhile, Ticketmaster had better be giving its software a closer look. Rumors are that Beyonce and Rihanna will soon embark on their first tours in years. Probably not together. That tour might break the internet. Those are, those are names I recognize, people. Rihanna once gained popularity singing a song about an umbrella. And Beyonce uh, like either really wants or really doesn't want a, a ring, I think, on, on it. Yeah. Is there anybody cooler than me? I don't think so. So that's what The Atlantic gives as its summary of events. <clears throat> of course, we're interested in a little bit more than that. And that goes to this whole Ticketmaster situation, right? How disappointed Taylor Swift fans explain Ticketmaster's monopoly. We're not actually going to go into all those quotes because that's not terribly interesting, but we do have a good summary here. Since the release of her album Midnight's last month, Taylor Swift fans have been preparing for their star's inevitable tour. Then there's a bunch of kind of fluff. Over the past week, that giddy anticipation liquefied into bleak, resentful disappointment. Just makes me sad. As tickets became increasingly difficult to purchase. Is it bleak? Bleak? Are you disappointed? Are you angry? Are you sad? Yeah. Yeah. According to Ticketmaster, there were approximately 14 million users on the site. We got all this info. Krista Brown, a senior policy analyst at the American Economic Liberties Project, which you might recall, we've looked at this before, explained to me that this swift failure is a symptom of a bigger problem. The AELP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that focuses on dismantling monopolies and lobbies to assert antitrust laws. So I don't know whether that makes you nonpartisan. Uh, if, you, if you look at what the American Economic Liberties Project actually wants to do is they want to be one of the primary architects of the modern antitrust movement, encouraging aggressive investigatory agendas, robust antitrust enforcement, anti-corruption measures, corporate accountability, and reinvigorated and a reinvigorated administrative state. Look, folks. This isn't a politics channel, and I'm not about to get anybody's ire up. Uh, and I don't know whether this is Democrats or Republicans in the United States, honestly, depending on the administration or the given day. Uh, but this is clearly a policy stance towards strong government and breaking up companies. That's a political policy stance. Is that one side or the other? Maybe not. Uh, but it is certainly a policy stance, and it's one that has been increasingly advocated for uh, in the halls of Congress in the United States for a long period of time. So this isn't a neutral party. Uh, despite what they otherwise say. Uh, and they are part of a coalition of organizations called Break Up Ticketmaster, seeking to undo the 2010 merger between Ticketmaster and concert promotion company Live Nation. Thanks to a web of exclusivity contracts with artists and venues, consumers usually have to go through Ticketmaster to see the artists they want to see. Artists face limits too, as many arenas and stadiums have Ticketmaster exclusivity deals wherein playing at a venue means using Ticketmaster as their vendor. So Ticketmaster signs up um, you know, concert halls or stadiums uh, and things like that. We don't go back to bad restaurants, says this particular person. If you have a bad restaurant experience, you leave because there's 20 others you can go to. But when you go to Ticketmaster, you prepare for a horrible experience and you're also prepared to have to do it again and again. Now, Krista here, uh, Krista Brown is not a Taylor Swift person, but she heard from a colleague that had a bad sales experience. As a fan, the first thing is that dealing with Monopoly is going to be a bad service and bad experience. Maybe. 
if you believe somebody like Apple is a monopoly and their iOS is a monopoly, then <clears throat> they got that monopoly by delivering what most people would consider a good experience, one that's worth buying at least. Uh, but um, yes, very oftentimes, if you've got a monopoly, you're going to have a bad time about it. Obviously, the Taylor Swift fans can speak to that. Ticketmaster's control of the market makes them a single supplier. of Tickets? Their website crashing is a bottleneck that wouldn't exist if there were other competitors that people could turn to. Same with the queue of over 2,000 fans. This is what we look at when we're looking at antitrust law as essentially the, the kind of multiverse. Like you have no idea, right? If Ticketmaster's situation is as described, they make some mistakes in the way they message it. But if it's as described where that many people interacted with their website at once, there's no guarantee that anybody could have handled it regardless if there were seven of them. And Ticketmaster is not alone in ticket sales, but it also ends up leading to higher prices for us and less negotiating room for artists or independent venues or the workers that end up dealing with Ticketmaster. That's generally the piece that as customers, we don't think about as much. No, I, I do. Because it's just Ticketmaster's ability to leverage their power and say, we have deals with almost all the largest venues and the venues that will fit Taylor Swift fans. We can pretty much demand whatever we want. And that's not to say that artists hate them. I think the biggest artists probably have pretty good contracts, but it leaves no room for the middle artists because they still have to deal with Ticketmaster. Oh, we slid, we slid to a new base. We slid to a new base, right? We're actually talking about Taylor Swift, who is not what we would call a middle artist, uh, but that the problem with Ticketmaster is, in fact, these middle artists and not Taylor Swift. So you're using Taylor Swift as a jumping off point to talk about what you actually want to talk about. Now, the rest of this interview, you can check out if you are so interested. This one is linked, maybe. If it isn't, I will link it after I, uh, I finish talking with you all. Uh, the other part of this, before we get into the, the antitrust, is I did want to say Taylor Swift finally spoke. There were a number of articles that almost made this video that were about Taylor Swift remaining silent on this. And here's what she said. Like I said, she's very good at PR and media. Uh, that's, part of, uh, that's part of her success. Well, it goes without saying that I'm extremely protective of my fans. We've been doing this for decades together. And over the years, I've brought so many elements of my career in-house. Honestly, Taylor Swift could have been covered here more often than she has for dealing with music licenses and re-recording things. Uh, she's been... Uh, a, a very powerful force and a lot of legally related concepts. I've done this specifically to improve the quality of my fans' experience by doing it myself with my team who cares as much about my fans as I do. It's really difficult for me to trust an outside entity with these relationships and loyalties and excruciating for me to just watch mistakes happen with no recourse. Lots of people outside of Taylor Swift and mass pop stardom have vendor relationships that hurt their brand, hurt their goodwill, that are very very much something that they have to handle uh, and that they're unhappy with at that vendor level. We write contracts, right? Uh, here at Hogue Law, and we try to get it to a place where you can enforce these things if your vendor goes wrong. Uh, but as I've also said in this space, contracts are just words on paper. Uh, and very often you've got these bad interactions and it doesn't make sense to sue them. <clears throat> and so you have to go and try to manage crises in, in public relations, which is one of the reasons I talk about messaging as much as I do. There are a multitude of reasons why people had such a hard time trying to get tickets and I'm trying to figure out how the situation can be improved moving forward. I'm not going to make excuses for anyone because we asked them multiple times if they could handle this kind of demand, and we were assured that they could. So not making excuses, but putting forward a little bit of blame. Get my name out of your mouth, and we're going to talk about what you promised us. It's truly amazing that 2.4 million people got tickets, but it really pisses me off that a lot of them feel like they went through several bear attacks to get them. And to those who didn't get tickets... All I can say is that my hope is to provide more opportunities for us to all get together and sing these songs. Thank you so much for wanting to be there. You have no idea how much that means. And that's a good statement. <laughs> now, on the one hand, she's not a corporation. She's a person. And so she can present a little bit more personability than some of these corporate lawyers are going to let but places like Ticketmaster. On the other hand, Ticketmaster and their lawyers and their PR teams have to get their stuff together. Uh, this is much, much stronger than what Ticketmaster put out there. Oh, and Tim Riggs has, a, has another thing to remind people of, which I think is important, uh, which is one of the very first things I said in Epic versus Apple, monopolies aren't illegal. As a matter of fact, if you get a monopoly power, if you get market control from delivering a better product at a lesser price, that's the ideal. The Department of Justice guidelines, the antitrust guidelines, the FTC's guidelines all say that we want to encourage that. We want to encourage you to be able to take over a market with a better product at a lower price. Um, or one or the other, depending on how that pendulum swings. And that's what heavy competition looks like. It's one of the main issues we've been discussing a lot in virtual legality with respect to Microsoft Times Activision, because there's this notion that if they go and buy this company and take Call of Duty off of PlayStation, that that's anti-competitive. And I keep saying, it seems to me that that's the height of competition. 
That is trying to harm your rival. That is what competition is. The antitrust laws are all premised on the notion that harming a rival is a good thing, that that results in that rival having to respond with a better product or a lower price. And ultimately, consumer goodwill is increased. And yet, that's not that's not how some of those things are being looked at by these regulators. And it might not be how Live Nation Ticketmaster ultimately winds up looking at, although with these kinds of stories, Ticketmaster winds up with a problem that at least at present Microsoft doesn't have, or at least at present Apple doesn't have. Because Apple has a lot of developers angry at it. It doesn't have a lot of customers angry at it, at least as far as anybody can see. Similarly, Microsoft has a rival angry at it in Sony. It doesn't have Xbox customers angry at it. It really doesn't even have video gamers angry at it, as best I can tell, though, God forbid. You get into the console wars, folks, and you start getting death threats. Welcome to my world. Um, so we'll just leave it at that for now. But the actual purpose of the antitrust laws is to make sure that consumers are made as well off as they can be and that we believe competition gets us to that. So thank you, Tim Riggs, for that reminder. I appreciate you. You're, 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 uh, you're, you're doing great helping me out uh, on reminder of these topics. Which leads us to this. And this is the reason that this even popped up on my radar, folks. The New York Times puts up an article that says the Justice Department is said to investigate Ticketmaster's parent company. So the way this merger between Ticketmaster and Live Nation was handled is that Live Nation ultimately became the parent company, the entire owner of Ticketmaster. For our purposes, we can think of them as the same entity. Uh, but the overall investigation is, does this kind of venue management service at Live, uh, Live Nation are they running afoul of uh, the antitrust laws? And there's more to this than even the other stories that we've covered because as we've talked about in respective purchases, this deal, Live Nation Ticketmaster, was actually blocked and asked for consents. Much like Fox and Disney had consents that Disney had to give, they had to spin off certain aspects of their Fox uh, product, uh, including the sports side of things. Here, Live Nation was required to give certain promises to the DOJ Promises that the DOJ is now saying maybe have been violated and were violated a few years ago. So we'll talk about this. The Justice Department has opened an antitrust investigation into the owner of Ticketmaster, whose sale of Taylor Swift concert tickets descended into chaos this week, said two people with knowledge of the matter. So anonymous sources, not really an obvious reason to lie about whether or not DOJ has opened an investigation. So we will take it with the grain of salt we always use with anonymous sources, but it seems likely. The investigation is focused on whether Live Nation Entertainment has abused its power over the multi-billion dollar live music industry. Many, 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 many people think they have. That power has been in the spotlight after Ticketmaster's systems crashed while Ms. Swift fans were trying to buy tickets in a pre-sale for her tour. But the investigation predates the botched sale, the people said. So this isn't actually the impetus behind this investigation. It's just a useful data point. Members of the Antitrust Division staff at the Justice Department have in recent months contacted music venues and players in the ticket market asking about Live Nation's practices and the wider dynamics of the industry, said the people who spoke on the condition of anonymity because the investigation is sensitive. Sure. The inquiry appears to be broad, looking at whether the company maintains a monopoly over the industry, one of the people said. And strictly speaking, this is a little bit inaccurate. You're allowed to kind of maintain your market position. You're not allowed to do things uh, to maintain it that are unfair or otherwise overly restrictive. Uh, Leanne with the super chat at some point, doesn't the monopoly become the opposite of competition where the barrier to entry for competitors becomes too high to be feasible? Yes, sure. <clears throat> so you're allowed to keep, uh, you're allowed to gain a monopoly and you're allowed to keep a monopoly as long as what you are doing to have that market share is in the product facing or service facing kind of sphere. You keep innovating on your product and it keeps getting better and that increases your market share or it holds it. That's good. We like that. If you are instead using your 95% market share to sign contracts with everybody that could uh, supply parts for whatever good you're into, whatever industry you're invested in, and you lock up all those parts, well, then you probably have a problem. You're using your market share to keep competition out. If you're just increasing barriers, if you're removing possible substitutes, if you're doing these various things, that's when you can start to get into trouble. But it's important to make the distinction, Leanne. Uh, because people do get confused. And, and it's one of the issues, I think, when we talked about Apple versus Epic that Epic had, which is that Apple got its market share and didn't really change the fundamentals of what it was doing. It was always saying you only have this app store. It's every app is approved by us. It's a 30% cut. This is how our system works. And we went from 0% before the iPhone exists to whatever our share is now, which I think is like 45%. And the main problem that I always found with Epic's argument is like they didn't change anything. They gained this from people that like this setup. <clears throat> 
And so if that is what is working in the market, we definitely don't want government regulators to come in and just redefine the market for us, uh, that they're bad at it. This is not a slight on government regulators. This is the fact that they're not actually in the industry. They're looking at it from afar. Uh, and so you don't want them to make choices for what the industry participants are doing. You just want to prevent them on a kind of referee of a sports ball match concept from doing the things that I usually use as a metaphor of instead of <clears throat> we don't want you to score goals on your opponent. We don't want you to take a crowbar out and knock their knees out. Crowbar bad, goals good. And that distinction is often difficult for regulators. No, no, no questions asked there. And it also requires through antitrust them to kind of foresee the future in a way that is very difficult for human beings to do. So this is going to come down to a your mileage may vary type thing. In general, historically, regulators, especially in the United States, have taken the approach to say, well, uh, really small markets that haven't quite settled yet, we don't want to really get and screw around with. Uh, other markets that have dynamic, uh, robust entrance and exit, we don't want to screw around with and, and things of that nature. And you can take a different stance, right? The European Union, for instance, has taken a more aggressive stance and say, well, if we can see a possibility, a significant possibility of something going wrong, even if it's not a surety, maybe we move against that deal. <clears throat> and the UK now with their CMA, their Competition and Markets Authority has kind of followed along with that. Uh, but it's going to be a philosophical kind of approach because I, I can just tell you right now, editorializing for me, uh, them seeing the future is often wrong, especially in technology. Uh, in fact, nobody, even a technologist, even an investor analyst on technology companies is very good at predicting maybe more than a couple quarters ahead. Uh, and so I do think we should be very cautious about getting them putting our thumb in there because for every uh, monopoly that you see, you've got whatever, you've got Meta losing 11,000 people and huge amounts of its stock price and potentially being replaced. You've got Twitter blowing up and potentially being replaced. You've got market dynamics that take care of these things uh, for us. So we, we want to have maybe not a light hand, but at least a considered hand uh, when we're looking at these things from a regulatory perspective. That's just my opinion. You might differ. Other people in the chat might differ on that, want more aggressive approach. Certainly Europeans tend to tend to advocate for that more oppressive uh, uh, approach. Uh, I said oppressive. I meant aggressive. Well, maybe both. Depends. I'm a corporate lawyer. What can I say? Uh, and so you have to kind of evaluate those things for yourself, but it is certainly the case that a monopoly a person with market power can abuse that market position, but it's not the gaining of the monopoly itself. That is the problem unless it is gained through unfair restrictive trade, right? Okay. Hopefully that was helpful. The law in antitrust is, is, is vague and often ambiguous and, and regulators have as much problem with it as, as other people. Um, so looking at whether the company maintains a monopoly over the industry, uh, one said, and they can, if they're doing good works, if they're not, then that's a problem in a statement posted to its website on Friday night, live nation said some stuff. Let's take a look at that right now. A statement from live nation entertainment. If you're not sick of corporate statements yet, well, we've got a, another winner here. <clears throat> As we've stated many times in the past, this is beneath us. We've repeated this a number of times. Live nation takes its responsibilities under the antitrust laws seriously and does not engage in behaviors that could justify antitrust litigation, let alone orders that would require it to alter fundamental business practices. We don't, we don't do anything wrong on this. The concert promotion business is highly competitive with artist management and control of selecting their promoting team. The demand for live entertainment continues to grow and there are more promoters than ever working with artists to help them connect with fans through live shows. The Department of Justice itself recognized the competitive nature of the concert promotion business at the time of the Live Nation Ticketmaster merger. That's what people want to roll back, Live Nation. That dynamic has not changed. Ticketmaster has a significant share of the primary ticketing services market. Why? Because of the large gap that exists between the quality of the Ticketmaster system and the next best primary ticketing system. So this is the legal argument you have to make. And I suspect uh, reasonable minds can differ on this. I suspect other of, of you in the chat will have had your own experiences with Ticketmaster and would say maybe this is or is not accurate. But again, what we just talked about, you're allowed to have a huge market share if your product is better or your prices are less or your efficiencies are greater or whatever it might be that makes it something that is you competing in the marketplace and not just taking out your competitors. So here they say Ticketmaster is great because we are that much better as a system than the next best primary ticketing system. That might be. The market is increasingly competitive nonetheless with rivals making aggressive offers to venues. That Ticketmaster continues to be the leader in such an environment is a testament to the platform and those who operate it, not to any anti-competitive business practices. Uh, you're confused, Department of Justice. It, it's not because we are killing competitors. It's because we're just that great. Five years ago, tickets were paper. Now you can scan them in with your phone and can transfer tickets to your friend with one tap. 
We innovate and invest in our technology more than any other ticketing company, and we will continue to do so. Secondary ticketing is extremely competitive with Ticketmaster competing with StubHub, SeatGeek, Vivid, and many others. No serious argument can be made that Ticketmaster has the kind of market position in secondary ticketing that supports antitrust claims. So they're worried about the primary ticketing that is from the venue, and then the secondary ticketing, which would be essentially coming from another person and then being resold out uh, direct from Ticketmaster. For the past 12 years, Live Nation has operated under a consent decree, we'll get back to that in the New York Times article, that among other things, seeks to prevent anti-competitive leveraging of Live Nation promoted content to the advantage of Ticketmaster. Pursuant to the amended decree, voluntarily entered into in 2020, <laughs> Live Nation's compliance is monitored by a former federal judge. Folks, folks, I am sure that they did not actually have a gun to their head. Uh, but when the Department of Justice comes knocking and says, we're going to need to amend your consent decree because we've got issues with the way that you've been comporting with it, you, you, don't, you don't get to call that voluntarily entered into We voluntarily entered into that plea bargain, Your Honor. Fair enough. Uh, there had never been and is not now any evidence of systemic violations of the consent decree. Okay. Well, I mean, they re-upped it. We'll talk about this in the New York Times article. It remains against Live Nation policy to threaten venues that won't get Live Nation shows if they do not use Ticketmaster, and Live Nation does not reroute content as retaliation for a lost ticketing deal. Ticketmaster is also the most transparent and fan-friendly ticketing system in the United States. Ticketmaster does not set or control ticket prices, strongly advocates for all-in pricing so that fans are not surprised by what tickets really cost, and is the undisputed market leader in ticket security and fighting bots. Ticketmaster also does not embrace deceptive and questionable secondary ticketing practices prevalent on rival sites, such as speculative ticketing. I don't actually even recognize this phrase. If Ticketmaster is accepting codes for more than what they actually have to offer, that sounds pretty speculative, but this might be referring to something else. We are proud of the work we do across both concerts and ticketing, and we'll continue working to improve and support the live events industry. So that's Live Nation. They want to go out there and say, hey, look, Department of Justice, we are so darn popular, not because we bought a monopoly position and we're doing things to maintain it by threatening venues and doing other things that could get us into trouble, but because our platform is just that good. But certainly others disagree. Officials in the Biden administration have spent the last two years trying to push the boundaries of antitrust law. Indeed, they have. The Justice Department has mounted several challenges to major mergers, successfully persuading a judge to block Penguin Random House's purchase of Simon & Schuster, which I intended to cover but got away from me during that period of time, but losing some other cases, significantly so. The Federal Trade Commission has sued to block Meta, Facebook's parent company, from acquiring a small virtual reality startup, and I will eat my hat if the FTC is allowed to do that block. Now, Facebook might drop out because Facebook is in a whole bunch of turmoil, but if they want to fight it, the FTC's argument on the within purchase is ridiculous on its face. And you know me, I'm not usually that inclined to get so harsh in my criticisms, but it is ridiculous. You can go check out the video where I titled the thumbnail, FTC has lost its mind, uh, to see how I feel about that particular deal. The new investigation is the latest scrutiny of Live Nation Entertainment, which is the product of a merger between Live Nation and Ticketmaster that the Justice Department approved in 2010. Now this jumped out at me, right? Because I'm always telling you that the Justice Department and the FTC don't approve deals. And technically, that's still accurate here. That's why they can re-examine it now. <clears throat> but it does mean that this is actually a deal that got blocked and consented to. So this is what this looks like, especially if you're here from watching uh, Xbox Times Activision. So here, January 25th, 2010, Justice Department requires Ticketmaster Entertainment to make significant changes to its merger with Live Nation, Inc., Software licensing agreement, divestiture, and anti-retaliation provisions will per, uh, preserve competition in ticketing in the United States. Did it? Don't know. The Department of Justice announced today that it will require Ticketmaster Entertainment, Inc. to license its ticketing software, divest ticketing assets, and subject itself to anti-retaliation provisions in order to proceed with its proposed merger with Live Nation, Inc. The Department of Justice Antitrust Division, along with 17 state attorneys general, filed a civil antitrust lawsuit today to block the proposed transaction. At the same time, the Department of Attorneys General filed a proposed settlement that if approved by the court would resolve the competitive concerns in the lawsuit. So this is that consent decree concept. This is what people don't get. I was talking about this yesterday, right? So the only power that these regulators have is finding that there is a breach of competition law if the parties don't consent to something. Uh, this case, it's divestiture, it's licensing requirements and things like that. We'll talk about that in a second. But if they don't first find that there's a violation of competition law, they can't actually go and ask for consents. They're not just emperors. <laughs> so they have to go and make this case. And then what you see here is kind of the ridiculousness of the judicial system. They sue and propose the settlement at the same time. 
Under the proposed settlement, Ticketmaster must license ticket software and divest ticketing assets to two different companies, and Schultz Entertainment Group, AEG, and either Comcast Spectacor or another buyer suitable to the department, respectively, allowing both companies to compete head-to-head with Ticketmaster. So they say, Ticketmaster, you got to license your software out uh, and essentially build competitors for yourself. The Department of Justice proposed remedy promotes robust competition for primary ticketing services and preserves incentives for competitors to innovate and discount, which will benefit consumers. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff tooting their own horns about how great they are at the Department of Justice. Yay for them. But here is where the problem lives. So they approved the deal in 2010. Uh, in 2019, its last year of business unaffected by the pandemic, Live Nation put on 40,000 events around the world and sold 485 million tickets through Ticketmaster. According to the company's annual report, Live Nation is one of the music industry's biggest powers in the management of artists, meaning the personal representatives who negotiate business deals on behalf of those artists. According to its most recent annual report, Live Nation had 100 managers working with more than 450 artists. It does not manage Ms. Swift. When the Justice Department approved the merger over significant opposition from the music industry, which makes sense, it required the company to sell some parts of its business. It also reached a legal settlement with the company that forbade Live Nation to threaten concert venues with losing access to its tours if those venues decided to use ticketing providers other than Ticketmaster. Those terms were set to last for 10 years, from 2010 to 2020. In late 2019, after an investigation, the Justice Department found that Live Nation had repeatedly violated this provision of its decree that they had, in fact, threatened venues, which is why this comes up at the end, right? The Justice Department says that this is what they found, right? And then we say, we have never done that. We don't control ticket prices. We have all-in pricing. We fight bots. uh, And we don't threaten venues, right? It remains against Live Nation policy to threaten venues. Now, if we're really reading this carefully, we know that policy doesn't actually do things, right? It's words on a page again. Activision Blizzard King had a big, strong policy about harassment, right? They put it in their documents in the lawsuit that they had brought against them by the state of California. And that's good. That's a good first step. It is necessary to operate a good workplace. It is not sufficient. So this is a great policy. You enforcing it? Are you threatening venues? What does it look like, Live Nation? Uh, And I can't, I can't speak to this. We're not in that room. We're speculating ourselves. But the Department of Justice put in an investigation and said that's a problem. And then they extended the terms of the settlement by five years. This is what Live Nation voluntarily entered into to 2025 and adjusted some of the agreement's language to clarify what the company was allowed to do when negotiating ticketing deals with venues. Members of the Justice Department staff have asked whether Live Nation is complying with the agreement as part of their new inquiry, said one of the people with knowledge of the matter. Officials at the agency have grown increasingly wary of such settlements, believing that the best way to settle antitrust concerns is through changes to a company structure. This is where the big fights are going to be if the Department of Justice and the FTC pursue this, not just with Live Nation, but across the various industries in the United States. So what this says from the New York Times, presumably on background or otherwise told by these people that they're conversing with on this, is that they no longer believe in consent decrees that have like licensing requirements um, or uh, things that are otherwise controlling of aspects of it. And this comes up with Manic for Software's Activision because we're expecting them to have a requirement that Call of Duty appear on PlayStation for a while, for a time. Um, If that is not, in fact, the case, then you start looking at breakups, right? So this is suggestive in the New York Times that the Department of Justice might be looking at breaking up Live Nation and Ticketmaster uh, for what they are doing, and that the debacle involving Ms. Swift has exacerbated complaints in the music business and put a spotlight on all of this, right? It made it to the the pages of the New York Times, digital or otherwise, (laughs) Uh, And so that's going to be a big deal by the time we get to the end of all this. Uh, And that is primarily what I wanted to talk about with you today, right? So we've got messaging, promise you messaging. We've got a description of the events. We've got antitrust law. And antitrust law that, to me, looks like it has more of an argument than maybe others of the kind that we've looked at before, right? Microsoft times Activision, I've said, wouldn't be a big deal in antitrust land uh, only a few years ago, certainly historically. This is the kind of thing where you've got these situations, you've got Taylor Swift, she's in the news. As I've always said, these regulators are political animals. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But when you see something that puts a spotlight on it that the consumers are interested in, yeah, you might make bigger moves than you otherwise would. And they were already investigating for potential threats on these on these concert venues. Um, and so forcing those venues to use a particular service is never going to be a great look. That's what I mean by restraint on competition, restraint of trade. 
Uh, and so if that is in fact the case, well, then you can start to get into real, real problems <clears throat> with the regulators in the country. And you don't even need to buy a new company today in 2022. We can just talk about the old companies that you already bought. So with the FTC going a little bit crazy, asking for divestitures of things from Facebook Meta, trying to block other deals of a very small size that really don't make any sense at all. You can see that we're in a world where people, industries, companies really have to start worrying about what it is that these antitrust regulators want to do. Now, the other thing I will add, which I also put in virtual legality all the time, is that the FTC and the DOJ aren't actually the final deciders on this stuff. Uh, that would ultimately come down to a judiciary that has to examine what these parties claim uh, if that goes to a lawsuit. The parties can always just say, all right, we accept, we're going to consent decree, we're going to divest, we're going to do whatever. Uh, that's how you see a, a divestiture coming from the UK for the Giphy uh, from Facebook. But in this particular case, I think that they have a better potential argument, depending on what they find in their investigation, <clears throat> than some others that I have seen. So as I said, we're not going to cover every angle of Taylor Swift. We're not going to cover every angle of the Taylor Swift incident with Ticketmaster or even Live Nation and the antitrust law. But hopefully this was helpful to kind of get a concept of what we're looking at here uh, with respect to these kinds of stories. What do you all think? I saw there was a lot of conversation during these articles. Thank you very much, Tim Rigg, for the multiple super chats and helping guide some of that conversation. I think you had some excellent points there. <laughs> Don't believe them for a second, says just Sarah. I don't know who the them is there. Probably Live Nation. <laughs> we got other conversations here that are happening uh, with respect to scalping. And I think there's something about uh, genetically modified foods here in the chat. I always love you guys talking about all sorts of stuff this morning. Hopefully this is a great way to send you off on your Tuesday. Uh, and we're already running past the nine o'clock hour. So maybe we'll just end this episode at this point. Folks, I love you. I love hanging out with you uh, for this show every morning. Uh, weekend Wednesdays are going to be a thing. And just as a reminder here this week, we are going to be skipping Thursday and Friday. It is American Thanksgiving. It is an excellent time uh, for corporate lawyers, among others, I think everybody, really, uh, to go and rest up for a sprint uh, towards the end of the year uh, as we handle transactions and things with clients and many more shows with you all uh, and virtual legalities in general. So with that being said, you won't see me in this space probably after tomorrow. You might see a virtual legality before then. You might see one afterwards, depending on if there's time and if there's something that just jumps out at me. But I just want to say thank you to the 750 people that are here right now with me at nine in the morning in Eastern Standard Time, having conversations about Taylor Swift, having conversations about Ticketmaster, antitrust, all sorts of fun stuff. I love you all. Have a great Thanksgiving if you're in the United States. Have a great other holiday if there's another holiday in your jurisdiction uh, where you live. And just have a great week if you don't have any holidays to celebrate. I will see you very soon, but not too soon. Have a great one, everybody.